Okay, so welcome back everyone. This is lecture 15, I guess. Yeah, it is lecture 15, but as usual, before we begin, a few announcements and more specifically about the exam. I don't know if you've noticed or not. Let me actually share my screen. On Submitty, we have this practice uh, thing going on. So this exam to practice test. Uh, if you just go in and try doing that, your actual exam two is going to look something similar to that, except that we just uh, put in here some uh, random, like not too detailed instructions, just so that you can go ahead and practice. So all we have here is like three problems uh, and, uh, and you have to write the code in here and try submitting it clear and, and try doing different things here. But this is more so that you can get familiar with how the exam two is going to be administered. Uh, you'll be obviously working on submittee and, and your problems will be here and with like the number of points that are assigned to each problem and then you'll be writing the code here. And obviously you're free to go and write in spider and then copy paste here, That's that works. Or if you like, you can write here, that also works. So it's up to you. But the important point here is that the moment you go on the actual, so this is the practice one, of course, but when you actually hit like submit or like when you start the test, committee is going to begin um, recording your time. And so uh, we'll be checking that you took exactly 90 minutes or not. Okay, questions, doubts. Uh, oh no, it's not supposed to be 10 minutes long. It, this is just like a practice one where, yeah, it's all actually written here. The actual exam will be structured similar, but just three to four questions in 90 minutes. To be more specific, because all of you requested, we are trying to have three problems only. So that's, um, yeah. Yeah, and it's due in uh, 9998, yes, <laughs> that's true. Uh, so yeah, it's confirmed, Anish, uh, to your question, yes, it's confirmed three questions because all of you were really, um, uh, convinced that that we shouldn't have more than three, so yeah, we will have three. Um, Peter, are there any examples? Uh, have you looked at the practice problems? I think they're going to be similar in like uh, on similar lines, but they could be a little longer given that you're doing it online and just like exam one, right? Similar to exam one, instead of four, we've come down to three because most of you requested that that uh, four was too much. So that's why we have three. Uh, Tyler, your question is exam two and future tests will be on somebody? Yes, uh, it, yeah, uh, the, the short answer to that question is yes. And that's because we really want to time people and, and we came across this issue that many of the students took more than 90 minutes. Some even took as much as three hours, which is why we had to make uh, exam a one optional. If you remember, that's why we, we're doing this. Um, okay, so any other? Let me scroll. Uh, Peter, your question is where can we start again? Uh, in the gradables, if you go to the gradables there, that's where you're gonna start. Okay, so just go and try doing that. On Thursday, if you remember, we have the practice session. So please come back uh, with questions about this on Thursday, that would be better because we have to cover this entire lecture today. And, uh, Eric, your question is, do we have a lab this week? Yes. Uh, Mike, uh, was the test made harder? So not deliberately harder, but the only issue that we were encountering was that each problem has like more weightage, right? So I don't know whether that's good or bad. Um, yeah, so we have to distribute points like uh, accordingly, right? So if it was like 25 per question is gonna be around 33 per question. Um, okay. Uh, the penalty for taking more time is going to be, I, I think we have uh, talked about, I don't remember the top of my head, but it increases as you go on submitting it later. Uh, please check the overview document. And if it does not give you the exact answer, um, I will come back with that exact answer on Thursday. Accommodations, yeah, you're going to receive an email from Cheyenne. So yeah, you will get the uh, amount of time that's required. So you shouldn't worry about that. Another thing that I wanted to talk about, let me see. Yeah, another thing is that we are staggering out how, when you start your exam based on your lab sections. 
So nothing to be worried about. You will receive an email or most likely a discussion forum post. For example, uh, I'm just giving you an example. It's not decided yet. So for example, lab sections one, two, and three uh, begin at 6.55 and then 10 minutes later, lab three, like sections four, five, and six begin. And that's the, the, the reason behind staggering is that many of you uh, face this issue of accessing the questions, remember, in exam one. And that was most likely because like around 700 people were trying to access at the same time. So if we stagger that out, um, that issue won't come up. So that's why we are going to do that. But everybody's going to get 90 minutes, obviously. Yeah. Okay, so please go ahead and try this practice test and whatever confusions you have about it, like after you've done a lot of testing around this, please come back, come back and ask on Thursday and I'll have like more concrete answers because that's a review session itself. So please do that. Okay, so moving on to the lecture for today, which is lecture 15, and we're talking about sets. So this is a new Python object type that we are introducing today. Uh, it's different from lists, sometimes more useful than lists, sometimes not, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a problem that we're going to solve with lists and then with sets and somehow compare them and see like which one is better than the other and why. Okay, so then just remember sets is a new... Uh, object type in Python, it is actually, it represents the mathematical no notion of sets, so it's similar to that. What we are doing is we are trying to find, uh, the example that we're looking at is to find all individuals listed in the IMDB uh, file. Let me first show you what this file looks like before we actually start uh, going in. And just to give you an overview, I'll, I'll just show you the file. Uh, we'll write a solution based on lists, we'll write a solution based on sets, and then compare them and talk about efficiency and set representation in Python. Okay, so we have this text file that has this data about movies. Let me show you how this file looks like. So I have like this IMDB 2010 to 12, so I've just like took out, I just took a, a, like a small portion of that entire data set. Uh, for, from the year 2010 to 20, 2012, but it's it's way, way bigger than this. So it has like all the movies, um, I think for more than 25 years or so. So as you can see, the very first element here is the actor name. And then the second one is the movie name. And then finally the year. And also notice that each of these elements are separated by this pipe delimiter. Right, so we know the structure of the file, and if you remember in one of our previous lectures, we talk about parsing through uh, regular tabular data. So this is that, right? This is regular tabular data because every line has the same number of elements, right? So this one has the name, movie, and then year. The goal for this problem is to find all persons named in this file. So essentially, we are trying to find out every actor in this entire file, right? So basically, create maybe. The first thing that comes to my mind is just go ahead and create a list, right? Create a list of all the actors. And yes, the answer to that uh, idea is yes, that's one solution. And we are going to implement that one first. What we are going to do is um, we are going to scan through this file. And, and by the way, there could be like different versions of this problem. Maybe just count the number of different persons named, right? Or find the actual names. Or maybe answer this question uh, like if, if a particular person is there in the file or not. So all those can be answered if we can somehow create a list of all the names that are there, right? Because once I have like this data structure that's a list, I can simply go ahead and scan through that and find if that person is there or not. I can find the length of that list and know, okay, these are the number of people. But I have to begin with like having some structure that will hold these names. Okay, so we are going to begin with the parser, like the initial parsing code that we wrote. So this is like nothing new, but still I'm gonna talk through this because you might be noticing a few new things here. So let's actually copy this here in Spider and then go from there. Okay, so that's, that's fine here. I'm just reading the name of the file, doing a dot strip because there could be space, right? Here I am uh, creating an, an empty list. So you're familiar with this. Now notice I have this four line in open. So we are used to writing the name of the file, but there is another parameter called um, encoding, right? So encoding is UTF-8. Okay, what is this, right? So nothing to worry about. If you don't specify any encoding here, that means by default, it takes this encoding as UTF-8. UTF-8 stands for 
uh, the type of encoding that handles English characters only. So this can this can handle all English characters and a few other uh, like some default ones. So essentially, this is the default for English language, right? We can change that, and and we're going to do that for the other example to ISO 8859. And that one stands for all international characters. So that takes into account other languages as well, right? So if you don't specify this, it's absolutely fine for English files. But if you specify this, sometimes this is required to read other languages, right? So that's why we have this extra parameter that we haven't seen before, but now we have it. Okay, then going here, line number 11, you have seen this one, right? Line dot strip, because this line is, is scanning through every line in my file. Let's look at the file again, right? So this is this is my line, and I scan through this, right? And do a dot split by this pipe delimiter. So if I do a dot split by that, I'm going to get a list of all these elements. And uh, name is which element? Which element do you think is name? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, everybody is right. Uh, the very first element is name, so that's that's all I need, right? So I'm just like capturing that in that that variable name, and all I have to do is go ahead and and put it in this names list, right? But wait, like if I go and scan through this file myself, I'll see that the, like many of the names are repeated. Many times, what you have is like this this same actor appears in some like multiple movies, obviously, right? So that that's repeated multiple times, and we don't want that in our list. We don't want multiple names repeated in our list. So uh, how to deal with that? There could be like multiple solutions. One of them is to go and scan through my names list and add a name if it's not there, right? So obviously it will allow me to add the very first name because there is nothing in that file, right? So it is going to allow me to, for example, if name in a name list. So. I'm not checking if name is there in nameless, but I'm checking if name is not in nameless. So just like do an inverse of this, right? So if name is not there in names list, then go ahead and append it, right? So name list dot append and append the name. Okay, and if it is there, like, then then it's not going to append, right? So this this is simple, and then like the the first thing that comes to my mind is just like go ahead and print it. We can actually go ahead and test this with one of the smaller files that I've created. This is called the Hanks file. So here I have only the actors whose last names are Hanks. Why? Because this is the way we test when we are working with larger data sets. It's not feasible to go ahead and check, like run my code for the larger file because the, the, the original IMDB file has around 260,000 or some entries. And so I don't want to run it on that, right? So here I just want to test it quickly and then move Further. So let me quickly test here, print a name list. And if this works fine with the Hanks file, I see that everything is going okay, then I can start testing with the bigger files, right? So let, let me test it here. Uh, the name of the file is hanks.txt. Okay, so I remember there were 13 um, like names, 13 or 14 unique names, I think 30. So we can quickly check the length of the list, yeah. So then that means, yeah, it is giving me the right answer. So how about testing it for bigger files? Okay, so here I'm also introducing a new module that's known as time, and you're going to use that a lot. So here I'm importing time, and why am I doing that? That's because remember we said we want to write two different solutions, one with the list and one with the set, and we want to compare them. So the very first comparison criteria is going to be how long does my code take to run, right? And is that significant or not? So all of that can be realized if somehow I can time my code, right? So the, the, the time module is there for us to do that. So if I import time, then there is, let me show you something before we use it, right? So there is this time dot time. Okay, as you can see, it is giving me some huge haphazard number. Uh, this is nothing but uh, an epoch. Epoch means the time elapsed on Unix-based systems from January 1st, 1970 up till now. Okay, then you might think, why is this useful for me? Because if I run it like a few seconds later, I'm going to get a set different time, right? So if I can just like subtract this from this, I can get the elapsed time of my uh, overall program, right? So basically if I do some like, if I capture the start time here in some variable, 
let's say start time and I do a time dot time, right? And then once like my program is finished and then here I can like add some code and maybe a variable that takes into account like end time, right? Again, time dot time and subtract the two and see how much time it takes, how many seconds it takes, right? So this is how we are using this here. I'm just adding another if block here, which is totally optional. That's because I want to actually see what happens after every 1000 elements are uh, scanned through my file. Because remember, this file has around 260,000 entries. Um, yeah, so this, this original file is 260,000 entries. So I want to see like how much time every 1000 lines or every 1000 observations are taking in order to be processed. Right, so I'm going to add that optional if block here to, to do that. So what I'm doing here is that if len of name underscore list has reached 1000, so this is the easiest way of checking that, right? Um, equals zero. Then just go ahead and capture the time, which I'm calling end time, right? So end time equals time dot time. Yeah, I'm going to take questions in two minutes. I'm sorry, I totally forgot about like I'm talking and talking and I'm just like, oh, I need to ask. So uh, let me quickly write the print statement and then I'll take questions and then we are going to run this. Okay. So after um, this, these many elements are added, the last 1000, 1000 took these many uh, seconds, right? So maybe just do a dot two F, right? Because notice this like this is a huge number, right? So let's uh, format it and get a nice output. Okay, so this is okay. Let's do a dot format. Okay, so the first one is going to be name list, right? We called it name list or names list, name list. And the second one is going to be uh, end time minus start time. Right, because the time elapsed is equal to whatever the end time is minus the start time, right? So end underscore time minus start underscore time. Okay, looks okay to me. Uh, let's see if we missed out anything or do we want to update anything? Yes, here, right? Because this is going to go into a loop and I'm trying to capture like every 1000 time elapsed, so maybe I want to do a start time update, right? It's, it's Again, this is all optional. It depends on how you want to like uh, run this entire code, but let me take uh, questions first. Uh, okay, let me see. Oh, lots of questions. Um, yeah, this the, the files are posted lecture15.zip, so thank you, Jacob. Yeah, that's the answer. Uh, Arya, your question is, why did you do LEN names? Okay, that's an excellent question. I'm doing, an, and as I said, this is the optional block. So remember this IMDB file that I'm showing you here? And by the way, this is 2010 to 2012. So this has around 25,000 values, but the original one has around 260,000 values, right? So huge. Basically, what I want to see here is that what happens in this list-based solution, because remember how lists are structured? Now my list is going to grow because I'm putting words in that, like I'm putting these names in that list, right? So I wanna see if there is something that's happening to my list as the size is growing. So every time what I'm going to do is divide the length of the list with 1000 and see how much time it took for the first 1000, then the second 1000 and the third 1000. And towards the end of the lecture, when I talk about the structure of lists, you will understand this better, why like every subsequent 1000 takes more value, sorry, more time than the previous one, right? So that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, Michael, okay, uh, is there 1,000 names in the, no, no. So there are 260,000 values in the, you could have done like 2,000 if you want to like go and check 2,000, every 2,000 values, right? Because the list-based solution is a sequential solution, right? Notice what's happening in this for loop. It's simply picking up one line, taking it out, right? The name of like the, the name of the actor and putting it in the list. Right, so we can even go in and check every 2000, that's fine. Um, okay, Michael, your question is, it's, okay, you already answered it. Okay, thank you. 
uh, uh, Gabe, your question is, why did you nest the if statement for finding the time within the duplicate name if statement? Yeah, so here, uh, like it's going to stay in this if statement for, for some time, right? And most likely, like I'm trying to do a break somewhere here, right? So I'm just like trying to check um, whenever this like reach reaches 2000, then just like go ahead and check. You can I think go go outside and also check because this, like there would be some time when it does not go into this if. But then in that situation, it is by default going like again and again into that if. So I just want to check like whenever more names were added, just go and check this if. So it's up to us. As I said, this is the optional part. Right. I could have directly done a start time minus end time, and that's it. I could I, I would know how much time uh, my algorithm took in order to run the entire like file. So this is optional how you want to structure this. I'm trying to structure it when my algorithm is adding names to my list. Uh, okay, so I don't see any uh, questions. More questions will come up when we start running it, actually. So let's actually start running it and then we'll we'll go from there, right? So I'm beginning with the IMDB 2010-2012 file first, and then we'll go to the actual IMDB file, right? So let me run this. Uh, so this is, if I remember correctly, IMDB underscore 2010 uh, to 12. This is what I named it. Okay, let's see. So we are doing every 2000, right? Okay, this was actually a better idea, uh, and I should have written 2000 here instead of, uh, but anyways, right? Or maybe run it again, I don't know. Let me run it again so that this doesn't create any, oops. Uh, I don't want to do this. Okay, this is weird because I didn't save it as a file. And yeah, I don't like this thing. But that's okay, let's run it again just to minimize confusion, right? Underscore 2010 and up to 12. I should have named it something better, honestly. Okay, so here we stop. This was for the file IMDB 2010, 2012, and this has around 26,000 entries. Okay, now notice what's happening. The elapsed time was 0 0.03 seconds for the first 2000 values. But for the next 2000, it came to 0 0.09. And every like next set of like 2000 observations, this is increasing. This is increasing. And this is, by the way, that the sum of all these elapsed times is the total time taken to scan through this file. And this by, by any standard, if I go and start running the original IMDB file, it is going to go on for almost forever. So let me run it for, for a few values and then we can just like interrupt it in between, right? Let me do that. Okay, I don't want to save it. Let's run it first, and then we'll stop for questions. So this is imdb underscore data dot tx. So this is the original with the two sixty thousand entries. As you can see, it will go on, and we are still at twenty two thousand. Here we are at twenty four thousand. Here we are at thirty thousand, and this has to go on until uh, around two sixty thousand, right? So I'm not waiting forever. I just stopped it. But with the increasing list size, the amount of time it's taking in order to add every 2,000 names is, is going up, right? So you can tell that the, the, the total amount of time is going to increase like by a huge amount. And that kind of tells us something about the structure of the list. Now going back to our if not name in name list, right? Notice what's happening here. Every time a name comes in, right? I go in like this if statement goes and scans through the entire list, right? If you remember, I don't know if we discussed that a lot, but let me kind of show you what happens in a list. So lists are these like sequential structures, something like this, right? So every um, element has a position. And the way the scanning happens, like for especially for statements like these, is that it's going to check like every element every element and then return whether that name exists or not. So ideally speaking, as the, the size of the list is growing, so is the number of operations that are required to scan whether that element exists or not, and then add it to the list or not, 
right? So these sequence these sequential uh, operations are slowing my processing down, especially with larger data sets, especially with a file like this, where I have like 260K entries. And I might have like 260K um, unique names. So you can imagine what happens to the size of the list and what happens to the time it takes to finish this entire processing, right? So this gives us a high level idea of why lists can be slow. We are going to formalize this structure of like sequential addition and sequential scanning of stuff in lists towards the end of today's lecture, right? So we'll have a formal sort of definition of representing why this is happening, right? But high level, you understand now why uh, like with every 1,000 new value or 2,000 new values, right? This time elapsed is increasing because the size of my list is increasing. Okay, questions before I like keep talking and, you know. Uh, okay, uh, where is the last question? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Mike, your question is, so it took 0.69 seconds for the entire file. I'm guessing you were talking about the previous one, right? Yes, so it no, it, you'll have to add, I think you'll have to add because notice I'm updating my start time, right? So the best way to, to find out what happened is that have this end time equals like time dot time here outside the loop. Then you'll know how much time it took. Uh, okay, Zika or Zikiao, your question is why is it getting slower? But I think I answered that, right? Because the list is getting bigger. Uh, Jeremy, you answered that, right? So. Uh, Sunny, can the computer work doing this? Yeah, I think so. Sometimes like with huge data sets, but like most of the ways, like the way our computers are designed uh, with this like slow, super slow computer of mine, I have worked with like really huge data sets. Uh, it takes more time, right? Uh, but I wouldn't say it can, it might, I don't know. I haven't worked with such a huge data set, but most of the computers today are powerful enough to handle that. Uh, Aaron, can you show the rest of line eight? Oh, yes, 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 why not? Yeah, here. I'm sorry, I should have done that. Uh, yeah, okay. So I think I've answered most of the questions. And by the way, like going back to Sunny, your question, uh, when you start running this file, you might not get the exact numbers that I'm getting. These are also, this is also important. And this is why we are going to formalize this thing about efficiency of programs and why one is better than the other, right? Because we cannot completely rely on the time my, my um, like program takes, like the physical time that my program takes. That's because it's system dependent. So your computer may run it faster than mine, uh, although there would be like some kind of uh, relationship, right? Like this, this, the way this is like increasing would be the same. So the trend is going to be the same but it might not take the exact number, like the exact time that my computer is taking, which is why we need some other way of comparing like one solution with another, right? So we are gonna talk about that, as I said, later on. But now, in order to deal with problems like these, where we know that the size of the list is like going really huge and we, don't, and we can see that the time it's taking to scan every element is, is growing um, like too much, we have something known as sets. Those of you who are familiar with uh, Java and other languages, you know hash tables or hash maps. So that is this is the beginning of that. So like uh, ideally speaking, hash maps are dictionaries that I'm going to introduce in the next lecture, but this is the beginning of that notion. Uh, this is like, I would say a specialized hash map, but not, not quite. So this is like a part of that. But here we have like, let's like, forget all of that and begin with sets. So sets are a collection of objects. Think about them as collection of objects that is different from lists in the sense that there is no indexing. So let me actually show you, okay, why sets are different uh, from lists. So we know that this is like a list, let's say like three elements, uh, one, two, three, right? But also we know that there is this position zero, one, two that's assigned to every element, right? And so if I add another three, this three is different from this three because this is at position three and that one is at position two. Okay. In sets, sets is, is more, low, more like one, two, three, right? I have this collection of objects. I don't care like whether I wrote it as one, two, three or two, one, three, because that collection, that existence of this object is important in that set. 
So my set is simply a collection of objects. There is no position assigned to any of these. So there is no indexing. These are collection, like think of this as a bag of things. There is no indexing, which is why the like one unique property that sets offer to us is that I, if let's say like I have the set one, two, three, right? And I want to add another three, but this three and three are the same. So if you go and add this three, uh, it will still stay one, two, and three. If you go ahead and add a four, then yes, that four will be added to this collection of objects. But the way the set maintains the, the, the things that are there in it is like unique because either I can have a one or not, or I can have a two or not. If you keep adding more twos, it's still the same object because it's the collection of object and not a sequence unlike a list, right? So this is the, the definition of sets and it comes from the mathematical notation or notion of sets. Okay, so it like there is no order to the values, as I said, it contains no duplicates because well, of course I'm saying this is a collection, right? So it won't allow those duplicates. And then it can contain whatever values we, we want to put in there. And that's because um, all object types like uh, strings, floats, integers, and even sets are allowed as, as objects. So let's, let's go in and see how we can create them. Okay, so one simple set, S1 equals SET, that's the keyword, and that's it, right? So if I created this S1 equals set, let's do a type on S1, right? It's a set type, so it's a Python object type, right? Uh, we can create sets using other iterables. So let's look at those examples. Uh, for instance, S1, uh, okay, let me call it S2 leave S1 as it is, um, could be set. So set is the keyword using which I can convert any iterable to a set. So for example, remember range function? So range internally is going to create some range of values, right? Let's say starting from zero up to 11 and two. And okay, let's print the set, right? So print S2 here. Now notice these curly brackets, right? These represent set, but going forward, these will also uh, represent dictionary. So I'm going to show you why, how, where the difference lies, uh, but, but just wait and I'll first show you how to create a set out of a list and then we'll talk about the curly brackets. But whenever you see curly brackets and these elements in it separated by commas, that's a set. Okay, so let's say I have a list V and it has some elements of uh, four, Eight, four, um, can have strings, right? Hello, and uh, 32, 44, 32 again, 66, 100. Okay, lots of values, enough, right? Okay, so that's a list. Let me do an LEN of V. So we are all familiar with how LEN works with lists, right? It has nine elements, right? Okay, fine. Let me go and convert that to a list. So, sorry, a set. Right, so set and set of v is going to be s3. Let me go and do an le. And by the way, len function works with sets as well. It's going to tell me the number of elements in my set, which is obviously going to be the unique number of elements because the sets won't allow that, right? Okay, so here the length of s3 is seven, whereas the length of v is nine. Uh, why do you think that's the case? Why is, although I created S3 using V. Okay, Mike, yeah, when you, uh, your answer is correct because sets, the, the moment I created sets, it does not allow any duplicates, right? Lubna, you're also right. It, it's, it, it's not allowing me to create duplicates. If there were duplicates in my original iterable, it got rid of that when I did an S, like a set on V, right? So we got rid of all the duplicates. Okay, one quick example before we move on. So in case your problem requires you to create an empty set, always create it like this, like S1 equals set and then this. Because like why I'm saying that is because you can also create sets using curly brackets directly, but these should have elements in them. Let me show you what I mean. So this is S4. Let's say this is, this is also, this is how I can directly create a set, right? So this is a set S4. Let me do a type on that. So type of S4 is a set. However, if I'm doing something like this, 
plus five equals, and then curly brackets, and the, the, these do not have anything in them, right? So let me do a type on S5. Okay, so this is a dictionary, right? So be careful when you're creating an empty set. For a set with values, you don't have to worry. You can directly go and create a set with curly brackets. Uh, that's totally allowed. But if you want to create an empty set, always use this. Because as I said, uh, sets are uh, generalized, like a more uh, specific version of dictionaries. Right? Now, if I created this and did a type on S5, this is a set, right? So this is a subtle, uh, like a small thing there, but yeah, it, it matters. Okay, so now we said that this is like a, a Python represent, like a new Python object type. And by definition, we know that Python object types are nothing but data representations, right? For example, strings, for example, lists, um, floats, integers, and so on. And one thing that we know about these Python objects is that uh, there is a certain way of representing them. For example, for sets, we are representing them by these unique values, right? And there are certain methods or there are certain functions that are specific to that Python object type. For instance, with uh, my set type also, I have some methods and obviously I can get all the list of the methods by using a dot, right? So dot methods we are familiar with by now. We've worked a lot of, uh, worked with a lot of methods with strings and lists and now let's start with uh, sets. So the very first and most useful method uh, with sets is dot add. Okay, let's see what dot add does, right? So I'm doing an S4 dot add to and let's see what S4 became. So it has like two, four, five, six, seven. I saw a question and I, I think I forgot to take questions. Uh, okay, I, I think I'll just like skip that UK US question for uh, later on. Uh, Okay, so the first method that we're looking at is dot add, and then if we add an element to, uh, you can see that it's it's there in set S4, right? The other method, the the like more useful of all the methods is dot clear. If you're trying to clear all the elements in S4, just do an S4 dot clear, and uh, S4 is an empty set because dot clear cleared it of all the elements in there. Okay, let's quickly check back the lecture notes to see if I've missed anything and then go from there. Okay, so we looked at two methods, dot add and dot clear. As you'll see, we'll use dot add a lot because mostly we are trying to, as you've seen like with lists, right? We do a dot append a lot. So similar to that, dot add uh, works with strings, uh, sorry, works with sets. And let me quickly go over. Yeah, so we know how to create a new set, how to create sets from iterables, for example, range and list. And sets have unique elements. So here, when we created uh, from this list, we created a set. It got rid of like this four and four and thirty two and thirty two and so on. Okay. Now move, moving on to some uh, really important and interesting methods, and these come from the definition of sets themselves from mathematics. So you might have looked at like you might have seen them before, um, but but let's let's look at them. Uh, I saw a few questions. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I am like, maybe I don't know what to call them. I just call them curly brackets. So curly braces or brackets, I don't know. Uh, is there any reason the set is, okay, Caitlin, that's a, an excellent question because uh, you know, the first time you look at sets, it's always like they're sorted, right? But then uh, look what happens uh, when I add, let's say I add some, some string to it, right? Sorry. Um, Let's say this, and yeah, that's a very good question because this is the usual, you know, confusion that comes up. And okay, so there isn't any order that this is following. Uh, when we'll talk about classes and we'll talk about how in classes we define the representation of an object, we'll know that this was the way we, like it was decided by whoever like created the, the Python object type sets that it will be represented like this. But these are not sorted, and I think the answer to that lies uh, in the fact that sets cannot be sorted. There is no position of these things, right? So it's, it's not really sorted. But yeah, the representation by default is like the, like, like this. 
right? So the, by default, the representation is like a is usually uh, printed out or shown to you in the in, in the like the output as like before B and, and four is shown before five. But really, there is no ordering happening happening here because remember it's a bag of values, so it's a collection. There is no like this this, is, this does not have a position, right? So that's an excellent question actually. Uh, Ashley, your question is: Can you convert sets to list? Yeah, you can do a list on this and and convert that back to. But usually, like in ninety nine percent of the cases, you need the reverse of that. So yeah. Uh, Billy, your question is why 32 is in the first place when, oh, again, regarding the ordering, yeah. So this is just like the way of representing. And again, when we start writing our own classes, which is like, you will create your own object of some certain type, right? And in that you will specify a function or a method that's going to um, represent your data. So so, so basically the that method uh, does that ordering, but actually there is no significance of like four coming before five or five coming before six. Uh, okay, so, okay, let's, let's move on to other methods and then come back to more questions. But yeah, these other methods are like really interesting. So let's actually create like two sets. Let me create S1 again. And this is set range and by like deliberately, I'm going to create such sets so that we can look at some properties of sets, right? So this is like, let's say S1 and let me create my S2 as, um, I don't know something that overlaps as well and have something, okay, maybe four, five, six, and then 14 and 15. Okay, so these are my two sets that I will be working with. And okay, the first method that I'm looking at is the difference. So S1 dot difference. So there are two ways of writing this. Uh, S1 dot difference S2. Uh, and this can also be written as uh, this S1 minus s2 even before we like execute this i want you to, to understand what's happening here like what this means actually and then we'll go from there right so let's say my set s1 is this right and s2 might be this because they are overlapping they have like common elements right so the, this is like this shows common elements and this is s1 and this is s2 so s1 minus s2 is going to represent this part excluding the one that's common and excluding the elements that are uh, only specific to S2, right? So it's going to just like discard all those elements and this is what S1 minus S2 means. If you do an S2 minus S1, the reverse, then it's going to like take it like this, the dotted area, and then just like the rest of it will be discarded, right? And also, whenever we are doing a difference, it's going to create a new set. This is also important, right? So new set that has only the elements that are there in S1. Okay, so let's execute this. And you can also write it like this, S1 minus S2, right? So that's an alternate of writing S1 dot difference S2 or S1 minus S2. Okay, did we actually create these? I, I think we did, right? Let's run it again. Yeah, so let's see what S1 has. So it has all the values zero up to 11, right? And then S2 has four, five, six, 14, and 15. So ideally speaking, it should have only the elements that are in S1 and are not in S2, right? So as you can see, it has discarded four, five, six, and it doesn't care about the elements that were specific to S2, right? So that's how difference works. The second one is intersection. You can now, by now, tell actually what how this is going to work, but still, let's look at it. Again, this can also be written as S1 and, so notice that operator and S2. Right, either you can write S1 dot intersection S2 or like directly this. Let me write it here. Yeah, like this. So either one is valid. Similarly here, S1 minus S2 was valid, just like this one. And if like this is creating any confusion, let me again show you in a picture what this is going to do. Uh, so if at all they're overlapping, if they're not overlapping, it's going to return an empty set, obviously. If they are overlapping, then it's going to return the overlapping part only. And again, this like whatever it returns is going to be a set. So even that is going to be a set, right? So this is what this intersection returns. Uh, let's run that, only the common elements. Okay, so only four, five, six were common and that's what we got. If we execute this, it is again going to return uh, four, five, six. Okay, 
The third method, if I remember correctly, was the union. And again, I, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar all, all, with all of those terms, but still just a quick review, right? Either you can write union like this or a short form is using this pipe delimiter. So you've seen that before in text files, but now it's also an operator with sets, either this or this. And let me draw a picture for union as well, so that we remember this all the time. Uh, let's assume this is my S1, and let's assume this is my S2. Now, in this case, it is going to return all of these elements, right? And it is going to return a set. Now, there are elements that are common to both, right? And because my like output is a set, so these will be counted once only, although they are in S1 and in S2. But eventually, like when I when I get the output of the union, I'm going to get only like this the, the common elements counted once. So they won't be counted twice because I'm returning a set again. Right. So that's and that's the mathematical definition of union as well, if you remember. Okay, so let's see what this union returns. Uh, yeah, let's let's execute this one. Okay, so as you can see, four, five, and six, the common elements are not repeated twice. And obviously, because I'm returning a set. Okay. Okay. Uh, there was two more, if I remember correctly. Let's see. Oh yeah, the is subset and the is superset. Yeah, let's finish that as well. Okay, so these are these two methods. They actually return a boolean. So S one dot is subset of S2. So if I'm writing uh, S1 is a subset of S2, uh, it, this means are all elements of S1 also in S2, right? Because I'm saying if S1 is a subset of S2, this is going to return a, a true or a false. And another way of writing this is S1. And this, this might be like more logical because we've worked with these operators, right? So this means is like S2, are all the elements of S1 in S2 or not? So uh, let me update. Okay, so this is going to return a false because obviously we have like two more elements, right? If I remove these two elements and create S2 again, right? And then do this thing. Oh, this is the opposite. Let me do it. So, sorry, sorry. This is, this should be like this, right? So yeah, so this is going to return true because I deliberately like have like four, five, six. And obviously four, five, six are there in S1. So all of them have to be there. Even if there's like one extra element here that's not there in, in my S1 like this, right? then this is not going to return a true. So this is returning a false. Similarly, we have something called is superset. So S1 dot is superset. And, and now you can tell it's the complete opposite of what we did above, right? So are all elements of S2 also in S1? just like the reverse and the, another way of writing it is is s1 greater than equal to s2 right so here it is going to return a, a false because obviously we like this is not true right so this these two are simple one important one that i wanted to talk about is the symmetric difference because this is one this is the one that confuses most people so let's look at this one and then i can take questions and then finally jump to our final part of the lecture so symmetric underscore difference S2. Let's see what this returns. And then there is another way of writing this. And I'm, I'm going to show you a picture as well. So S1 and this operator, this small, I don't know what to call it, tilde or whatever. Uh, I don't think it's called tilde. I don't know what, what it's called, but it's, it's, it's used for symmetric difference. And now notice this returned certain elements here. Let me... Okay, let me create S1 and S2 first. Maybe I, okay, yeah, yeah. I think this is correct, yeah. So let me show you what symmetric difference does. Um, basically, if I have S1 and S2, this is going to return a set with values in either S1 or S2, but not in both. So basically I'm returning all these values here and these values but I'm skipping the ones that are common to both, right? So I, I, it's either in S1 or in S2. So this is more like an R, and this is also going to return us. So that's what symmetric difference is. Uh, okay, so that's that. Let me take questions before we move on. 
Uh, I am not getting the joke about carrot <laughs> cake. So please, somebody is going to repeat for me after the lecture because I'm, I think we are really like behind. Uh, okay, can we go over superset again? Of course, of course. Where is this one? Here. So here I'm saying S1 dot is superset S2, right? This means are all elements of S2 also in S1, right? Um, so S2 has like these elements, right? Let me remove this. Okay, and then create S1 and S2, right? And then let's see if S1 is a superset of S2 or not. It is. So, so as you can see, like see the name itself suggests S1 is a superset of S2 because all the elements of S2 are there in S1. Uh, symmetric difference, yes, of course. So symmetric difference is that it includes everything but the common elements. It's the complete opposite of intersection. So the, what this is doing is go and grab all the elements in both this and this, except the, the elements that are common to both, right? So if I have like a 100 here and I have like some common values, right? But there are certain values that are not common. It is going to pick up only those values. Let's see. Here, it did not pick up four, five, six because they were common both to S1 and S2. Okay, great. So we know a lot about sets. We know the basic structure of sets. Let's go back and see if there's something remaining before we move on. Yeah, this is a good exercise to better understand uh, S1 and S2, just like create your own sets of like some actors who are in comedies and some actors who are in action movies. And then what do you think like this, this, this means, right? So this is a good uh, exercise. Okay, this is about lecture exercises, but rather I'll just like move on to the problem first. And then if we have like time remaining, we can go over that. Uh, I'm guessing we covered all of this, right? How to create a set, how to add elements. You can do a multiple add to the same set and then we did all of this right so we understand this is the difference this is the intersection union subset uh yeah okay i am jumping back to our problem the imdb problem because we said the issue with our original code was that it was really, really slow and as the size of my input was increasing it became slower and slower and so on right so Another solution that's posted on the course website is to sort uh, the list. So if you use a function sorted, the Python built-in function sorted, in that case, it is faster than the list-based solution that we talked about earlier. And that's because the structure of the sorted uh, function is such that it takes less uh, time. And I, I'm, I'm coming to like how that time is defined, but I recommend that uh, we go over that quickly. So let's see what this is doing. Uh, this is lecture 15, but there isn't anything much different from what we're doing here, except that I'm going to create this name list and I'll not have this like if statement that scans uh, my entire list, right? What I'm going to do here is just keep putting every element essentially in the list, sort that list. Once that's sorted, just keep checking when a change in the name occurs, right? So whenever a change in the name occurs, that means a new name uh, is, is, has, has been entered. So I'll keep a count. Of, of those changes. So it's similar to one of the problems we did earlier. So please go over this solution, but now I'm jumping over to this, the faster version that's using sets. And all we have to do is like slightly modify what we already have. Okay, so let's look at that if we don't have any more questions. Uh, okay, I don't see. Okay, you can do all, so Jemmy, your like whatever you've posted there, you can do a lot of such operations because obviously they're related, right? So definitely uh, try doing that and also try doing with different values in sets S1 and S2, and, and you can definitely prove that. So all that comes from mathematics itself, right? Okay, jumping, I'm just like, I know I'm, I'm like worried that we might run out of time and I don't want that. So the list-based solution is faster because the internal structure of sets, sorry, uh, the sets-based solution is faster because the internal structure of sets is such that you, it, it's, not a, it's not sequential, right? So there is no position to these elements. The moment you're, like, you're trying to find a value, it's either there or it's not, right? The other thing is because we're trying to keep track of like this uh, unique names, 
by structure, sets will not allow a duplicate. So all I have to do is just like, instead of this like name list or whatever, I can create a set instead of a name list, right? So let me call it names and not a list, right? So names is an empty set, right? And I'll just keep like scanning through this file that I have, the IMDB file, and start picking words. So all of this stays the same, right? Pick the first word, all of that stays the same. The only thing that I have to do is in names, just go ahead and add that name. That's all, because the uniqueness will stay, right? Nothing is gonna change there. And let's look at the final time now, because like many of your questions, why we had that if, so not like, let's not even take that into account. Let's see how much total time this entire thing takes, right? So time dot time, right? So that's end time and time taken by maybe have a print statement here saying time taken, I don't know, time taken is enough. <laughs> and it's this dot format. And we're going to have end time minus start time. Right, so this is going to tell me how much the time uh, elapsed and then also print whether we have the right solution or not. Uh, and definitely test this with the Hanks file because we already know that Hanks has like 13 or 14, whatever names, right? So number of unique names and yeah, number of unique names is going to be LEN, right? LEN of names because LEN works equally well with sets. So that's it, like it made our life really easy. As you can see, all I'm doing is like getting the name in every iteration and adding to my set. I don't have to do any scanning of whether that exists there or not, because if it's there, it won't be added because the set won't allow that. Otherwise it will be added. Okay, great. So I think that's it. Uh, encoding we can uh, like, okay. So UDF8 is going to work well with uh, my IMDB file, but there is another encoding that's shown here. And this is just like to uh, introduce to you that with different language files, you should use this ISO 88591, right? So for the, as far as I know, for the IMDB, this will uh, work anyways. So let's stick with that because right now we are focusing on how much time this takes. Okay, so remember I was running this file earlier here, uh, the IMDB 2010, 2012, that has around 250, 25,000 entries. Let's run this with that. Okay. So I am DB, for some reason, I've named this file like really bad. Takes me forever to, okay. And I should have done a dot format to F because this is looking really weird. Let's run it quickly again, I know. And you can tell that like it scanned all the elements in like 0 0.05 seconds almost or 0 0.06 seconds, right? But let's quickly do that, I am DB. Okay, so here, the total time taken to scan all those values and get with the, like, the number of unique names was 0 0.05. If you remember from our list-based solution, and even if we are doing the sorted thing, it is definitely going to take more than this, right? So this is like extremely, extremely fast. And the, the reason being that the way the, the sets are structured, there is no sequence of values. Either a value is there or not, and the values is directly accessed, right? So if that value does not exist, the set is going to add that, otherwise not. Okay, so as I said, we are now going to come up with a more uh, theoretical way of determining whether one algorithm is better than the other. And for that, what we are, we are doing is we are defining this notation that is order n. Okay, what is this order n? Before you get confused, let me quickly take questions and then introduce that. Uh, okay. I don't see any questions for me, right? Mike, uh, maybe that, that was a question. I'm just like assuming, I don't know, no need for an if statement skipping duplicates. It will automatically do that with a set. Yes, okay, so specifically the dot add method, what it does is that it, the, like there is something known as hashing in computer science. So this is doing internally, this is hashing the value to my, my name. So it's essentially, uh, think of it as like jumping, uh, directly to get the value if it's there and not allowing a duplicate. Otherwise, it will uh, just add it there. So this dot add 
is ensuring that my set, because my names is my set, right? So it will not allow any duplicates to kind of be added. Uh, okay, so going back to the lecture notes, just to make sure that I haven't skipped anything. Okay, so actually we did a comparison of running times for both our solutions, right? We have seen what happened to our list-based solution. Even if we do the dot sort solution, it is going to be a like slightly improved version of this one, but still not as good as my sets solution. So what's going on? Now, the first thing is like, let's say I give you a program and I, I'm also running the same program. And I ask you to go ahead and time it, right? So you'll go ahead and time it and you'll say, okay, it took me 0 0.05 seconds. But if I go and run it, and let's say it took me 20 seconds, right? And I come back and say, oh, it took 20 seconds for me, and it took 0.5 or 0 0.05 seconds for you. How is that possible? The first thing that comes to my mind is, did you run it with the exact same data set or not, right? What was the size of the data set? Let me write it down. So the first thing is we have to have the same input size, right? Now, I can have like access to, let's say, 100 observations. You can have, maybe you had access to only 10 observations. So you, run, you ran your code with 10 observations and then you came up with the time, which was like, let's say 0.5 seconds. And I came up with like 10 seconds or something, right? So like, although ideally speaking, we are running the same code, but we are not quite comparing it the way we should because we are running it with different like um, input sizes. So in like mathematics, we have this notion of expressing the efficiency of any algorithm and the comparison of any algorithm using this variable called n. So n is actually representing my input size, right? So basically I have to come up with some n that's uh, comparable, right? And also it, it's not just that, but also come up with the definition of my efficiency, whether this algorithm is better than the other in terms of my n, right? Because definitely my, my code is n dependent. I can tell from here. Right, my code, my algorithm, the, the time it takes to run depends on my n, depends on the size of the data that I'm running my code on. Okay, so that's like point number one, n is important, right? Point number two, as I said before, if you take the same code and run it in your computer versus your friend runs it on some other computer and I'm running it on my computer, there will be a systemic difference. Right, and it depends on a lot of factors, including the configuration of the machine that I'm running my computer, like my uh, algorithm on, and, and and many other like variables that are specific to my machine. Right, so this is like this is not a good uh, sort of uh, way of comparing uh, algorithms because uh, we need some theoretical basis, we need some definition to sort of come up with something that's that stays the same for my computer and your computer. Right, so. What we do is in mathematics, we come up with something known as the order n or order n notation. So O and n. So we compare every algorithm in the number of steps it takes to achieve its goal, right? And this order, the word like this big O, this is also known as big O notation. Uh, right, and this big O notation is universal throughout. So irrespective of where you run your uh, algorithm. I'm not specifically talking in terms of time, although time falls in line with this, but time wasn't a good measure of like comparing to, like an algorithm, whether this is better than the other. But this is because this is more like a theoretical way of expressing the number of steps that my algorithm is going to execute in order to achieve its goal, right? And those number of steps should be a function of my n, right? It should be a function of my n, or it should be a function of uh, how my n, like my, the size of my data is incorporated in my uh, algorithm. Okay, so everybody understood what this order n notation is, right? Or are there any questions? Okay, let me actually tie it to a loop so that you can better understand what this order n notation is doing, right? Uh, rather, let me take it to uh, file. Okay, let's let's assume we have a for loop, right? All I'm doing is a for i, let's say for i in range n, and this n is let's say 10, right? Uh, print i. This is my algorithm, that's, that's all I have. So if I have to like mathematically represent the complexity in terms of the big O notation, 
for this particular algorithm or this solution, I will just see that the size of the input is n, which in this case is 10, but obviously I have to express it in terms of n, right? So what happens is that the number of steps in terms of n that this like entire for loop takes is order n, because this, this entire for loop is going to run from zero, one, two. So these are the number of steps, right? And in every iteration, I'm essentially adding one step until it reaches this n, right? So the total number of steps, we can say, it's like safely say that this is linear in n, right? So the total number of steps it's taking is equal to n because I executed this n times, right? This, this will execute n times. Now, if I have a nested loop, so for i in a range, I don't know, some number 10, right? And then for uh, j in, again, the same number 10, like this is the most generic case that I'm, I'm talking about. What, what's happening here is that the number of steps that this algorithm is going to take in terms of my input n, whatever that n is, because this is a nested loop for each n, the rest of the n's will be executed, right? And then again, for, for another, like for each uh, like number, outer number, again, the inner entire loop will be executed. So if you think about it, the number of steps is going to be n times n or n squared. Right? So whenever there is a nested loop, the complexity of the algorithm becomes order n squared. Roughly the number of steps this is going to take, and this is approximate, right? This is not the exact, because we cannot sort of come up with the exact number, but we need some comparison measure, and this is the one that's used in mathematics and computer science. So we can compare, so that we can compare another algorithm with the, the same number of steps, right? So the total number of steps that this like nested one is taking is of the order n squared. Okay, why is this important now? What is this like, how is it helping us, right? So that's the question. Now, now we know how to get the order and notation for like some basic algorithms, right? Because this is, this is going to be the number of steps, right? But now the question comes, why is this important? Now this is important because let's say this, like I'm looking at an order n algorithm, right? And the size of my uh, n is 10. So my, the number of steps that this algorithm roughly will take is 10, right? If the size of my n is 100, the roughly this algorithm is going to take 100 steps, which is okay, right? But what happens here? If the size of my input is 10, how many number of steps will this algorithm take? Roughly, approximately. Anyone? No, I'm not talking about, this is not about time. This is not about time. This is telling you the number of steps. This only tells you number of steps. It has nothing to do with time. Exactly, so wh whoever is saying 100 steps, that's correct, right? So roughly I can say any algorithm of order n squared with n equals 10 is taking around 100 steps, which is okay. But if n becomes 1000, right? The number of steps become 1000 raised to two, right, n squared. If the number of steps become 10,000, this becomes 10,000 squared and so on. So you can tell that any algorithm that's taking order n squared, right, in any way is it's kind of bad if I'm using a bigger data set, right? Because look at the way this is like adding up, the number of ste steps are like really um, adding up quickly, right? And that is impacting the time that my program is taking to execute because I can roughly calculate the number of steps and those number of steps impact my overall time. Okay, so having said that, let's go back to our list-based solution. If you can see here, right, there is a for loop outside. So let's say n was my input, right? And then here, there is another if statement. And in is similar somewhat to a loop, right? In, what it in does is that it, it goes and checks every element in a given list, right? So can you just like by looking at the structure of this? Why? Uh, sorry? Was... Okay, maybe that was by. So can you just by looking at the structure of this, like let's say the input is n. So can you tell the complexity in terms of the order O notation? What is the complexity of this uh, algorithm here? Excellent, Theodore. What you said is correct. Because remember, this is approximate. Now I'm going to tell you why this is order n squared. Here, here we, whenever we are, we are trying to formulate the order, it is the worst case complexity that we are talking about. What happens to the worst case? We have to look at the worst case uh, situation. 
So here the worst case is that my, five, my for loop is going to scan the entire n. And the other worst case here is that this, sorry, not this, sorry. This not in name, when we go and do an if not name in name list, is going to scan the entire list. And the worst case could be that every element is different, right? So the worst case is that this is scanning n elements. And then this is also checking the entire list of n elements. So roughly, as I said, this is the approximate value. So the number of steps is order n squared. Now that explains why my code is slowing down uh, when I was running it for like a larger data set, because remember it has like 25, the smaller file has 25,000 entries. So roughly 25,000 squared steps. And that's adding up to my time, right? Okay, great. All of that is, is awesome. So what's happening here then? Oops, where is that? What's happening here? Okay, so hashing is a constant operation, so that's good news for us. If there is, a, and, and like if you don't understand all of this, that's all, all, all okay, right? Just remember, like whenever we are doing names.add, there is an operation hashing that's happening uh, underneath. And the good news about this hashing is that it's it's a constant, which means the order complexity for hashing is order one. It's not even n, right? It's not even dependent on my n which is really good for my uh, solution, right? Because here you can tell, what do you think is the order complexity of this algorithm? The outer one is dependent on N, right? So what do you think is going to be the complexity of this one? Just like the approximate thing, anything? What comes to your mind? Yeah, Charles, what you said, Carter, exactly, right? So this is going to be order N because the inner one, does. it's not impacting my solution because it's constant, it's order one. And that's how hashing works. And most likely you're gonna take data structures going forward and you'll understand how hashing and why it is order one. Uh, but definitely it's out of the scope of this course because that will take another lecture to describe that. But it's okay for you to just remember that this is a constant operation, an order constant. And whenever you have an order constant operation, it's not dependent on my input, which is N, right? It's good in terms of uh, the, the, the complexity is lower. And it's good in terms of the time this algorithm takes, right? So that, that's good news for us because it's using hashing. And despite me going and adding a new name every time in this loop, it's still order n, which is why it was, it, it kind of finished so quickly, uh, like even with the IMDB file, although I had like 25,000 values, but I had to just count these like 25,000 values only, right? So roughly I had 25,000 steps. Versus for the list-based one, I had 25,000 squared steps, right? So there's a huge difference. And as N grows, this, the, this difference becomes like huge, right? This difference is going to grow. And so that's why we need to express every algorithm. That's why we need to express every solution of ours um, in terms of this order uh, complexity, right? Because we'll understand that this is where I'm going wrong and this is why my algorithm is taking more time than the other. Okay. So let's go back to the lecture notes and then see if I've missed out anything. Okay, so now we know why the list-based solution is order n squared, right? So we understood that. Here it, it talks about hashing. The add method is using hashing and the order of that is independent of the size of the set. Um, okay, so the good news is that the set-based solution is only of the order n, right? Uh, yes, we will discuss more of this order a notation later on in the course when we start talking about algorithms, right? But we have introduced that. So you have like a rough idea of what's going on, uh, why this is important, how can we categorize algorithms in these? So I would say like develop a habit of like whenever you write a, a solution, try to find out the order or, or like uh, the O notation the, or the order of N of your algorithm because it gives you a rough idea of how much time is going to take if let's say this was a, my code was running on a huge file, right? Um, and, and also like going forward, it's useful to use more of sets and dictionaries versus lists, especially when dealing with larger data sets. Uh, but yeah, obviously we cannot discard lists. So there are certain applications where lists are better than sets, where lists are better than dictionaries. So we have to use them. Um, yeah, but, but know that like this is why like my, my solution is getting worse and my solution is taking more time. Okay, so I think uh, that's that's largely what I wanted to cover in today's lecture. Uh, in order to like summarize, um, let me see if I've missed out. Anything. I'm just like always thinking. 
Yeah, this is an important point, yeah. So if like I'm writing a program for a smaller data set, then efficiency doesn't really matter. For example, if I was running this for my uh, Hanks data set, right, it would like not even take this much time because it was hardly like 40 or some values in my Hanks file. But if I'm running it for the original IMDB file with 260K values, then it matters and it matters a lot, right? So even if you're using a list-based solution, it's smaller now you can tell why, right? Because the order, the number of steps that your algorithm is taking is dependent on my N, which is nothing but my data set, right? So for programs like small problems, it's, it's okay. Use any data structure you want, but for larger programs, for longer programs and when you start working with larger data sets, efficiency matters a lot. And we saw that actually, right? So sometimes it matters so much that you have to think of a better data structure than what you're using because the number of operations that your program is taking to like execute and, and finally finish is, is huge, right? So make sure that you make the right choice of the data set, that, sorry, the, the data structure that you're using uh, in order to work with larger data sets. Uh, okay, so that's about that. In summary, we talked about sets today, right? Uh, and sets in Python realize the notion of mathematical set. So if you're familiar with math, sets from math, uh, you're most likely okay with sets in Python. Uh, we also talked about a few operations, especially the methods, difference, union, intersection, and subset, right? Is subset. Those are like really uh, useful. The combined core operations of finding if a value is in a set and adding it to the set are much faster when using a set. We know because of hashing, right? And we will continue with more examples, as I said. Going forward, we'll compare a set-based solution to this problem and a dictionary-based solution. So we're going to build on this file, get familiar with the IMDB file going forward. And please go ahead and try writing the code yourself and testing it with different values, with different subsets, right, of the file itself. Um, so that's it. That's it from my end. If you have any questions, please stay back and ask. And otherwise, that's it from my end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me look at the questions. If anybody asked any questions. Um, Professor? Yes. yes. I saw that under the lecture exercise for 15. At mm -hmm. the top, it said that the lecture exercise was due on October 27th at noon, 12. But then on submitting on the gradable section, it says it's due at um, like 11.59. Oh, I think that's quarter. a typo. Yeah, that's a typo. It has to be like 11.59. Yeah. So okay. we'll go by whatever is there on submitting. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Are sets going to be on the exam? Yeah. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, uh, like your voice broke. Can you say that again? Are sets going to be on the exam? Uh, so for the exam, we posted an overview document that tells you what all is covered and sets are not on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, will there be a timer on submitting? Uh, yes, as I said, uh, the moment you, s let me show you actually. Just give me like a visual one that we can like see. No, or is... that no, unfortunately no. Uh, oh, okay. You'll have to. Yeah, that I, I understand because that was the first thing that came to my mind when I saw that on somebody that we need a timer there for you guys, but you'll unfortunately have to like time it. Let me see. Like, let me check. Yeah, the moment you click that, it kind of starts to time you, but it doesn't show here. Um, if there is a possibility of adding it here, I'll go and add it. I'll reach out to the submittee team and ask them if we can add a timer. So, yeah. Okay, but if not, because... in the current uh, way, it's not there. For example, here we have... Okay, it is showing me some duration because this was open for a very long time for me. So, basically, it's showing me that I took four hours, six minutes. Can you go and just, like, try doing, like, that now because it's just, like, a practice? And we can see what's going on. On uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, let's see, like what time it shows you. Uh, Devanshu, I just saw your question. So we'll be typing code into somebody box. Yes, right. 
But then you can definitely go ahead and type that in Spider and then paste that here. That's also up to you. Or directly type in here, whichever is better for you. It's not showing me anything on the bottom. Okay, so then that, that, that means, yeah, because I had that question uh, even with the Summity team that can we have a timer for everyone to see? But uh, yeah, I don't think we can. So the best is like the moment you click uh, there, just keep a timer there for yourself. Does okay. that answer? Yeah, and like do, do not like uh, panic uh, if you're like, just because of the timing thing, you went a, a minute or two ahead. Because as far as I remember, we're going to start penalizing after 10 minutes are over, right? So if like you submit it, obviously you have to submit in 90 minutes, but you started submitting and then you lost one or two minutes in submissions. That's okay. I right, just go ahead and submit it. So, yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah.